Welcome to the 2015 Rancho Mirage Riders Festival. Tonight's program is dedicated to the Rancho Mirage City Council. Welcome to the stage, founder of the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival, Jamie Kebler, along with Rancho Mirage Library Director, David Bryant, and the mayor of Rancho Mirage, Iris Smothrich. One year, two festivals. We've come a long way. Tonight, we saw a festival. We have, this is really an international festival. We have writers who've flown in from Bolivia, from England, and I'm real excited. Dave Barry, one of my favorites, has flown in from Miami. Dave, wave for us, will you? <laughs> Tomorrow, do not miss Amer do not miss comedy night. It's going to be extraordinary. Each night's very special. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a second and give us a give a warm Rancho Mirage welcome to our writers. If you'll stand, the writers who are here tonight start our festival, please. So, so, so starting tonight, we're going to be filming a lot of our speakers, and you'll be able to see them on Rancho Mirage Television, Channel 17, and then later on our website, so stay tuned. Um, we also um, want to start a new tradition, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and say hello and introduce yourself, would you please? Okay, so that, I hope that starts a tradition every evening and every day. Make new friends. That's what this festival is about, all right? So Palm, we're, our, Rancho Mirage and Palm Springs are home to many distinguished writers. None more distinguished, I hope you agree, than Herman Woke. He's asked me to read this message to you, the writers, and to the readers. Fellow authors, and possibly dearer to my heart, readers. My love of literature has always been my life work. Such a destiny has been a blessing far above my youthful imaginings. To my fellow authors, I would say simply persevere. First and foremost, writing is a hell of a lot of work, and one may give years to work that fails to please, as I have done. If you press on, though, as a writer, and if you have that calling, nobody really knows it but yourself, your hour may come. To all of you, fellow writers, the blessing of a very aged fellow worker. To readers, to readers, all hail. May you be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> Herman Woke. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is David Bryant. I'm the library director, and I have a terrible voice, so forgive me. 800 of the smartest people in the Coachella Valley are here in this festival. I have, and you'll notice your badge has the uh, Roman numerals. It's kind of a thing that Jamie and I like very much. So for XLV years, I have been a library director. <laughs> and I have Long never had a lot of rhythms, gag, fast paced gag rhythms to a top and top staff guiding it. And that's why we are lucky. Way we are so lucky. A library centered festival of um, the status 
of this grandeur but and of this quality. As I started looking into and I, and I started to do my research about six years ago, as you spoke to uh, got access to all the local archives, which are now... Speak to your neighbors throughout, because we're all meeting each other, we're all excited about reading and the value of books in the 21st century, and we're on to something very, very special. Thank you all very much for coming. Tonight we are giving special tribute to the city council, who early on were supporters of this great idea a Rancher Mirage Writers Festival on an annual basis. So, if I may please, I'd like to ask the council to stand, beginning with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dana Hobart, <laughs> Council Members Richard Kite, <laughs> Council Member Ted Weiss. I don't see Charlie Townsend, is Charlie not here? Thank you all so much, and now it's my privilege to introduce to you the best mayor in California, and possibly the United States, <laughs> Iris Smotrich. Yay! Thank you all, and good evening. What an exciting evening this is. It is quite amazing, and Jamie has been able to pull it off like no one else. How fortunate we are to have a world-class writer's festival in our beautiful city, making Rancho Mirage Writer's Festival a venue to make so many of today's great authors accessible to us all. These writers will bring wonderful books to life in our city. An amazing gift to us all for the next three days and three nights. I am so honored to be a part of that council that welcomes everyone and supports the festival and all the readers and authors and we and wel <coughs> welcome them to our resort city. We are so amazed that this is taking place, and we're amazed at what an incredible happening this has become so quickly. So it is my honor at this time to declare the second annual Ri Rancho Mirage Writers Festival officially open and underway. Welcome. Yay. Please silence your cell phones. And now, welcome to the stage, the president of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands, Jeffrey Cowan. Let me say that a couple of things about Rancho Mirage. For one thing, we, we're celebrating the city council, which is the most nonpartisan and bipartisan of entities, and frankly, if the country could model itself after you, we'd all be in a lot better shape. And I also can't help congratulating Jamie again, but also congratulating Jamie's angels who are here, who make this possible, and also making sure that everybody knows that one of our Sunnyland trustees, who happens to be Jamie's daughter, Elizabeth Sorensen, is here as well. You're about to hear from somebody else really quite wonderful. Richard Zoglin uh, was with Time Magazine for 30 years. He's still with Time. But during the last several years, he's had a dream job, I should think, which he's been a theater critic for Time Magazine. Can you think how much fun that would be? Go to theater, any show you want to see, and you're there for Time Magazine. But he's taken on a project, which we're going to hear about tonight, about another of the real legends of the last 100 years. And actually, a man who he makes the case was perhaps the greatest entertainment, entertainer of that period. The man who he's going to talk about also happens to be our hometown hero and really the hero of the institution where we're standing right now, Bob Hope. Please join me in welcoming Richard Zog. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just do that. Um, I was glad, I, it's so great to follow Scott Berg, one of the, one of the great, great biographers in this country, and uh, I was very happy to see Bob Hope's face spring up on that Goldwyn uh, uh, montage. Uh, the one story it reminded me of, uh, Mel Shavelson was a writer for many years for, uh, for Bob Hope and, uh, and uh, worked on several of his movies, and he is, his assistant told me uh, that Shavelson got ulcers when he was very young. And, and someone said, how, how, why'd you get ulcers so young? He said, 
two things, Sam Goldwyn and Bob Hope. <laughs> so uh, probably two of the toughest people maybe to work for. Um, I, it's great to be talking about Bob Hope here uh, on Bob Hope Drive, on land that Bob Hope donated. Uh, the week of the golf tournament that used to be named for Bob Hope, and in a room full of people that I assume uh, is full of people who probably met Bob Hope, which uh, makes you one up on me, unfortunately. I'm just a poor biographer. I actually was in the same room with Bob Hope once, a restaurant in Banff, Canada, of all places. But I didn't meet him. My wife did, um, uh, but I didn't. Little did I know. Uh, it was only years later that I um, decided to do a biography of Bob Hope. And people want to know, you know, why, why Bob Hope? I, I grew up with Bob Hope, watching his movies, and I had seen him kind of drift off the radar, I think, in, in the world of entertainment since his death. And I, I, I kind of wanted to, to rediscover Bob Hope. And one of the reasons, I'm going to show you first a clip from the kind of thing that I, this is what I grew to love about Bob Hope, scenes like this. The scene I'm going to show you is from Road to Zanzibar. The second road picture with Bing Crosby. Um, and just take a look. Go. inside this thing? A million bucks! How long can you hold your breath? I don't know. I never tried. Well, try it. Why? Try it! <sighs> How long did I go? Hey, get that thing out of here. It's alive. It's an octopus. Let's see. It's probably the greatest idea I ever had. Get this for a setup. We'll build a tank a little bigger than this. He will dress you up like a pearl diver, a little sarong or something on you. Then you hop into the tank and you razzle with him like you did with Bonzo the Bear. Do you remember how we cleaned up on that? Why, it'll be terrific. Fearless Fraser, barehanded, wrestles with the terror of the deep. No, sir. Wait, wait, I don't mean right now. I mean when you get feeling a little better. I'll never feel that good. That thing's got eight arms. I only got one and a half. Well, what's the matter with that? I don't like the odds. Well, if it bothers you, we'll snip a couple off of him. Wrestle an octopus? Yes. Yeah. Me? Those things are murderous. Uh, that ain't spaghetti he's waving, you know. Besides, they're poison. They spit ink. That's all the better. You can wrestle him and ride home at the same time. Look, I've had enough. I can't do it. Dick Tracy can't. Uh, 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 uh. Junior, never say can't. You can do anything that you think you can do. I know. Last week you told me I could fly and look a broken wing. Well, you tried to land downwind. You can't do that. Look, Chuck, I don't know what you want, but why don't you slip in some night when I'm asleep and just put a shotgun to my head? Oh, you're slipping. You know that, don't you? You're really slipping. I'm trying to make a big fella out of you, a famous man. They'll write books about you. Yeah, and I know three words that won't be in them, ripe old age. Why, it's a cinch. We'll train him. Train him? Yeah. I'd look fine swimming around with a chair and a whip. You can't train an octopus. They only know from one thing. Grab you quick and suck the blood out of you. How would I look going around with no blood? Just, Just the, the same. same. Besides, why train him to wrestle? Why don't you train him to knit? Knit? He could work on four sweaters at the same time. I'm really ashamed of you. Afraid of a poor little thing like this. Why, the man I bought him off of raising him from a little bitty polywog. Look, look here, I'll show you how gentle he is. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Come on, man. <coughs> Just for that, you go back to the fish store. How do you like that? Go ahead, write a letter. I love those films. They, they, um, they, so fresh, 
almost improvisational, it seems like. Hope used to uh, talk about ad-libbing on the set of the road pictures. They, they, these weren't really ad-libs, but what they would do is they would have a script, and then both Hope and Crosby would go back to their writers, their radio writers, and have them punch it up, try out jokes. And they would come into rehearsals and they would throw in jokes that the director often didn't even know about. The ones that worked stayed in and the ones that didn't, uh, you know, were dropped. And, you know, I've seen scenes in the road pictures that I go back and look at the script and the scene is not in the script. So they clearly were improvised on the set. And this was so fresh and these, these pictures, uh, they're the greatest buddy films ever made, in my opinion, and they, uh, they still hold up today. They're so modern. As the road films went on, they did lots of breaking of the fourth wall. They would talk to the audience. They would make comments about their own uh, careers, the studio, uh, and it was just, they were just great fun. Those are the films I grew up with. Um, but the reason I really decided to do the book was I did, and I, I like talking about why I did the book, because it gives me a chance to plug my first book, which was Comedy at the Edge, How Stand-Up in the 1970s Changed America. This was a book where I interviewed uh, the, the, the stand-up comedians who came after Lenny Bruce, who um, kind of thought of themselves as that rebel generation, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Robert Klein, down through Steve Martin, uh, Andy Kaufman, Robin Williams, up to basically to Jerry Seinfeld. And I interviewed all these guys, the ones who are still around, and I would always ask them who they grew up with, who, was, who were their influences, what comedians they admired. Uh, if they didn't mention Lenny Bruce, because a lot of them did, um, they would they'd talk about other of the sort of new wave comedians like Jonathan Winters. Occasionally they would talk about the classic comics, but it would be somebody, it would be Groucho Marx or maybe Jack Benny. Nobody mentioned Bob Hope. Nobody. He was so off the radar, and that, that struck me as really unfair and unjust because, in my opinion, Bob Hope basically invented their art form. Uh, Stand-up comedy in the form we, uh, we know it today, really, uh, you have to look back at when Bob Hope was doing comedy. There were vaudeville comics before Bob Hope, but they were mostly doing packaged kind of routines, joke joke book sort of gags, they, they often did characters, they played ethnic types, they had partners, think of Burns and Allen. Um, Bob Hope came onto radio in 1938, and the other radio comedians who were the big at that time were Jack Benny, who had a, uh, had a character, the cheapskate, and he had a little circle he, he, of, uh, you know, of friends and, and his butler, uh, uh, Rochester, and he'd make jokes about his money vault or his antique Maxwell car. So, you know, that was his little comedy world. Bob Hope had, had nothing like that to start out with. He was really on, on radio starting from scratch with just his jokes. And so he said to his writers, um, read the papers. Come up with jokes, you know, what's going on in the country. Uh, Every, you know, f f California weather or, or, or things that were happening in Bob's own life, his golf game or his friendship with Crosby or a Hollywood marriage or a piece of gossip or something. And that's what they built his monologues out of. Well, believe it or not, at that time, that was almost brand new. No one was doing that, that a, stand a comedian's, you know, jokes would relate to something in the outside world and not just his little circumscribed comedy world. So that's why I say the topical monologue I think really, really started with, with Bob Hope in the form that we know it today. There was Will Rogers before, people tell me. Of course, there was Will Rogers. He did uh, political humor. But, you know, he was a drawling, folksy. Nobody imitated um, Will Rogers. Bob Hope brought the kind of vaudeville rhythms, gag, fast-paced gag rhythms, to a to the topical subject matter, and that's what I think created, paved the way for everybody who does stand-up comedy today. Um, but as I started looking into, and I, and I started to do my research about six years ago, uh, got access to all the Hope archives, which are now at the Library of Congress, interviewed everybody who was still around, who knew Bob, and of course, Bob lived to 100, and uh, had been gone for a few years, so most of his, his contemporaries were gone too. But there were a few around. 
uh, and I got to them all, starting with the oldest first. Um, <laughs> and uh, sadly, uh, you know, many of them are, are gone. Um, but I found as I was doing my research that Bob Hope, he was more impressive to me than I even knew. And I called him the most important entertainer of the 20th century. And I, um, that's a bold statement, but I, I really can defend it in a lot of ways. First of all, he was the one entertainer of the century who was successful and, and often number one successful in every single major field of popular entertainment of the century. His story is the story of 20th century American entertainment, starting with vaudeville. Bob Hope was headlining in vaudeville and on, on, at the Palace Theater, at, you know, the, the number one vaudeville house in the country. When vaudeville started to fade, Bob jumped into uh, Broadway theater. He was starring in Broadway musicals in the 30s uh, by the major American composers, Jerome Kern, uh, Cole Porter, Ira, Ira Gershwin. Uh, and then in 1937, he moved to Hollywood. He started his radio show in 1938. In, within, by 1941, it was the number one radio show on the air, passing Benny, passing Bergen and McCarthy, passing everybody. And all through the war, he was number one, partly because of his military broadcasts uh, during the war, and stayed number in the top five for basically a decade. Uh, his movie career started in 1938 with the big broadcast in 1938. Was, he started fairly late. You know, um, he was 34 years old when he went to Hollywood which, you know, all his other contemporaries, Benny, Burns and Allen, uh, had, had all been movie stars. Crosby had been a star since, in, in movies since uh, the early 30s. So Bob was starting fairly late, but very quickly, within two years, he was in the top 10 box office stars and stayed there through the entire 1940s. And in 1949, he was the number one box office star in America. One year after that, less than a year, um, in April 1950, he did his first television special. Now this was really amazing because Hollywood, big Hollywood stars did not do television. The studios hated television. They were scared to death of it and worried that their stars would, you know, if they did television, it would hurt their box office appeal and, and um, demystify them a little. Bob Hope didn't care. Bob Hope went where the audience went. He did his first special in April 1950. He did specials continuously, never weekly, and that was important because he didn't burn himself out, um, but monthly specials or maybe six or eight a year for 40, over 40 years. Uh, all of them, almost all of them top rated. Uh, his a, a record of, of rating success just has never been matched in television. His 1970 special from Vietnam, Christmas special from Vietnam, was the highest rated television show of all time at that point. And it still to this day is the fourth most watched television, uh, entertainment television program of all time, setting aside sports and the Super Bowl. But it, the only entertainment shows ever to be watched more was the last episode of MASH, the last episode of Dallas, and the last episode of Roots. And then comes Bob Hope's 1970 Christmas special. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that is just an amazingly impressive achievement to me. But I call him the most important entertainer for more than just what he did an, on screen. I really, you know, talk about off screen. I think Bob Hope, in a lot of ways, redefined what it means to be a, a, a Hollywood star in the modern age. And he, he did it by the way he conducted himself as, as a star and as a celebrity. First of all, he was one of the first stars to set up his own production company, to decide he didn't want to be a salaried employee of a studio anymore. Uh, he wanted to own his own, at least to have a profit share in all of his, his, uh, his work. He actually went on strike against Paramount Pictures for almost a year, 1944, 45, uh, when they refused to let him do that, and he refused to make pictures um, until they finally relented and he set up his studio. Now, he wasn't the, uh, the first. You know, Bing Crosby had one, uh, had set up a similar kind of thing too, uh, but Bob's was the most publicized, the most successful. He, it, it made him rich. And I do think it's the model for every, now every star of any stature at all 
automatically sets up his own production company and uh, that, that basically was modeled after the one that Bob Hope set up in 1945. Um, Bob was the first Hollywood star to, dis to recognize that he was a brand. Um, the idea of branding himself, he, he wasn't just a movie star, a TV star, uh, radio. He, um, he wrote books. He started writing memoirs when he was barely in Hollywood, 1941. Um, he wrote a newspaper column uh, for the Hearst Syndicate for several years in the late 40s, early 50s. He, uh, in the 50s, there was a, a comic book, a Bob Hope comic book. He, of course, hosted a golf tournament. And, and, and how many stars, Hollywood stars, have their own logo? You know, that little line-drawn uh, profile with the nose and the chin that everybody recognizes. Um, so, uh, you know, I call it, he, he was the guy who discovered the brand extension in Hollywood. Uh, but maybe most important, uh, I do think that he really was the role model for, for public service in Hollywood. Everybody remembers the, uh, Bob's um, work for the, uh, entertaining the troops starting in World War II. Um, he wasn't the only one by any means, but he was the one that connected with the troops. Uh, he became a national hero. And after the war, he continued, not continuously, but in 1948, he went to Berlin to entertain the troops at the, during the Berlin airlift. Uh, he went to the Korean War. Uh, and then starting in the mid-50s, he established his yearly Christmas show uh, tradition for the troops. Uh, that combined with the charity work that he did, and, and no one in Hollywood did more charity work than Bob Hope. I mean, he would sometimes, you know, 150 to 200 benefit appearances a year. The guy was, uh, you know, just inveterate he, he, and, and tireless. Um, all of that, I think, by example, Bob Hope said to the rest of Hollywood, you, you have an obligation, you know, a, a movie star has an obligation to do more than just make movies, sign autographs, and buy a fancy homes in, in Palm Springs. Uh, you, you have an obligation to give back, in, in a sense, to, do, to work for causes, to, to have some kind of role on the public stage. Now, no one had a role on the public stage like Bob Hope. I mean, he, he was friends with every president from... Um, from Harry Truman through basically to George W. Bush um, and close with many of them. He, uh, no, one, no one in Hollywood was like that, but he, I think he, made, he, he was the role model that I think today's sort of generation of activist stars, the uh, Angelina Jolie's and George Clooney's uh, of the world, I, I, I don't know if they would recognize it or admit it, but I think they owe a debt to Bob Hope because he made it safe for celebrities, Hollywood celebrities, to have a role in the public stage, to be, to be taken seriously as public citizens. So the causes may be different, and the political views may be different, but um, he, he, w he paved the way. Um, I think, you know, the question is why, what happened? Why, why isn't Bob Hope as celebrated. I, I felt like I was saying obvious things in my book, all of this. Uh, and yet a lot, you know, people are surprised. Uh, I think two things. It's pretty easy to see what happened to Bob Hope, I think. One, of course, was Vietnam. And during the Vietnam War, he was doing exactly what he did in, in World War II. But, you know, in World War II, uh, the country was united. He was a hero. Uh, in, war, in Vietnam, he didn't realize the level of dissent and the, the opposition to the war. And he also crossed the line from being a patriot to being a partisan. He was speaking out uh, in, in, and very close to Nixon. Nixon would bring him into the White House and, and lecture him on why he was bombing North Vietnam or whatever and expect Bob to go out and kind of carry the message. And I think Bob was very flattered by that, and he, and he did carry the message. And this, of course, alienated a big part of the generation that came of age in the Vietnam era, uh, me included. And, and I think that especially to the younger comedians 
who thought of themselves as anti-establishment rebel um, kind of voices, um, Bob Hope was the establishment, and they just felt that he was not relevant to them. So I think Bob is still, his, his legacy, his reputation is still, you know, been still recovering from that. And I wanted to kind of, you know, recognize that. That's certainly part of his legacy, but to go beyond it and see what else, what, you know, he accomplished. Uh, the other thing that happened to Bob Hope is he stayed around too long. As we all know, he, he couldn't stop performing. He was, you know, addicted to it. He loved the applause. He, he, um, he loved being famous. He loved being a star. He loved being out in, in the public. He loved talking to fans. You know, a lot of stars are full of angst about, uh, you know, being famous and, and complain about the lack of privacy. Bob Hope didn't. He loved being famous. And he couldn't stop. And then he, you know, in those last years, he was uh, uh, getting pretty frail, losing his eyesight and his hearing, and uh, uh, it started to get a little uncomfortable to watch Bob Hope. And I think that so many uh, younger people, the, the, the image they have of Bob Hope is, unfortunately, of those, those later years. And so, um, you know, I wanted to go back and, and look beyond all that and look at the whole thing and take the full measure of his achievements, which I really think hadn't been done. So I was very proud and, and, uh, to, to write the book, and it was such a great, fulfilling experience for me. Um, one of the things that Bob was, of course, best known for was the Academy Awards. Um, nobody hosted the show more times. He hosted or co-hosted the show 19 times. That's way more than anybody has or ever will. Um, and he was really the voice of, of, of Hollywood for all those years, when, you know, particularly in the 50s and 60s when he was hosting that show. He first started in radio before the show was even, uh, I, I shouldn't say radio, he started but when, when the show wasn't even um, broadcast on radio, when it was just a private dinner in Hollywood. Um, but I, I think you can credit Bob Hope with one of the reasons that show is so popular, is such the focus of the Hollywood year now, is, is what Bob Hope did to make it a great show. And the other thing, I think that you could say that uh, a lot of our, our image of Hollywood in the rest of the country kind of comes from Bob Hope's jokes in those opening monologues. Um, the, he, he was this little window into this exotic community uh, where, you know, there were famous rich people with lavish homes and bad marriages. And uh, they were gracious and glamorous in person, uh, but, but petty and backbiting and jealous in, per in, um, in public. They were glamorous in private. They were, um, you know, jealous of each other, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that's, that was the kind of jokey sort of way Holly, uh, Hollywood pr was portrayed in Bob's monologues, and I think that kind of is the way we, we view Hollywood today. So anyway, uh, Bob's, of course, running joke was that he never won an Academy Award. And uh, everybody remembers his famous line. It was in the 1968 Academy Awards. He says, welcome to the Academy Awards, or as it's known in my house, Passover. <laughs> uh, and it was a great running gag for him you know, in reality, did Bob Hope deserve an Academy Award? Probably not. He, of course, it was a little misleading. Bob Hope got five honors from the Academy, including the Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award. Five, more than anybody else. So it's not as if they ignored him. They loved him. Um, but he never got an acting uh, a, a nomination, nor did he necessarily deserve one, but he was a better actor than anybody realized. And I... I wanted to close out with, with a clip from one of my favorite Hope pictures, and a, a picture that shows him the, the other side, the, the, the range of Bob Hope. He, he didn't do really many straight, he didn't do any straight dramatic roles, but he did do some films with some dramatic elements, and one of them was Sorrowful Jones in 1949. Uh, this was a film based on a Damon Runyon story. It had been previously filmed in, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Shirley Temple as Little Miss Marker. It's about Bob Hope plays a bookie, 
Um, a guy comes to him, puts a bet down, doesn't have money. Uh, he puts his little girl as a marker for the bet. The guy gets bumped off by gangsters. Uh, Bob Hope is saddled with this now orphaned little girl. So let me just show you one scene, and this will give you another side of Bob Hope. Sorrowful Jones, 1949. Oh, not talking like that ain't nice. I've been mean to speak to you about that. That's okay for you and me, but no telling who else might be listening. Do you mean God? Yeah. Yeah. Daddy said there's nobody named God. When did he say this? When my mommy went away. Yeah. Well, I guess your old man did get kind of a tough break, but what he said wasn't right. Not just right. I mean, there is somebody named God. Did you ever see him? Well, he doesn't hang around horse rooms very much. But if you ever want anything and you can't promote it for yourself, I, you just ask God. And often as not, he comes through. Do you write him letters like you do Santa Claus? That, that's where praying comes in. You say three cents. Then show me how to pray, please. Go to sleep. But I want to ask for something. I never knew a dame who didn't. Okay. Get out of bed. Oh, don't tell anybody about this. See, I don't want it to get around. Now kneel down. Put your hands together like this. Shut your eyes. But why? How do I know? I don't make the rules. Who does? I like the racing commission makes the rules of the track. I guess there must be a praying commission someplace. Oh, what does the commission say I should do now? Just say like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. If I should die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take. I pray the Lord my soul to take. And God bless Sorrowful, Gladys, Regret, and everybody. And God bless Sorrowful, and Gladys, and Regret, and everybody. And Dreamy Joe, too. Oh, yeah, him most of all. He's closest to going. And Dreamy Joe most of all. He's closest to going. Is that all? Yeah, that's the works. But when do I ask for what I want? Oh, well, you better slip it in right now while your prayer's still hot. Please, dear God. Bye, Mr. Sorrowful New Suit. With two pair of pants, please. You know, uh, Bob Hope could have done, I think, that, that was, that's a wonderful movie, one of his best. He could have done better. I think he, he, uh, he never worked for a major, major director. I mean, a, a, a Billy Wilder or Howard Hawks or... Uh, you know, someone like that could really bring out um, more of him. But the films that are there are, are, are great, and I encourage you to go back and look at them. And I thought I'd end a little early so I could get some more questions, because I'm sure there are a lot of people in here with um, thoughts and experiences about Bob Hope. And I can't see. Oh. I am oh. glad you wrote that book, because Bob Hope was a great American, a great man. He was. And I gather and you, the kids should go back to what he does. Yes. Kay well, Ballard, Kay Ballard, who... Also, Mirage should fight to get that. He started the Bob Hope Classic. Why they took it away, I'll never know. Well, I, I agree, and uh, I think it's wonderful that you, you told me that you appeared with Bob, and that's, uh, you know, what's amazing is that everybody w that I would tell... Uh, I was, when I was working on the book, I would say, what do you work, they'd say, what are you working on? I'm working on a book by Bob Hope. Everybody I knew, I mean, people in show business, out of show business, everybody had a Bob Hope story. He just touched so many people. People, uh, you know, encountered him in so many different ways, and he's so, so much a part of people's memory. So, it's wonderful to hear. Yes. Any, um... 
Oh. Absolutely, and um, I know that he donated the land, and, and she was the driving force, I understand, behind it. Um, and I know that Bob Hope was a fixture in the community, and an honorary mayor, and everything. Um, so, I, I, I love coming back here. I, I got to tour the house uh, a few years ago, um, when, they, when Dolores was still alive, and they... Um, um, they still owned it. I guess it's on the market now, but uh, uh, I, I think that, you know, the community, you know, feels really close to him, and uh, I'm glad to hear. Uh, one more, yeah. Bob was always coming up with new and fresh uh, material. How did he do that? How, how did you guys keep that material just rolling? Well, he had more writers than anybody in Hollywood, <laughs> and he admitted it, and that was one of his innovations. You know, he never pretended that he, he didn't, didn't use writers. He, he admitted it. He used them as the butt of jokes. When, the, when a line wouldn't go over, he would uh, cr made a, make a crack about the writers. And he was very upfront about it. And he knew that he needed the material. He would have, for each show, he might have two or three hundred jokes written. And then he would go through and edit them, pick the ones. And he was a great editor. People say he was not a, you know, some of the younger comedians might dismiss him and say he didn't write his own material. Well, he did not write the jokes, but he edited those jokes. Sometimes he would shape them, he would cut them, he picked the jokes, and he could ad-lib, too. When those jokes didn't work, and he, you could hear him uh, you know, make a wisecrack when, to try to save a joke, or when there was a flub on the set of a movie, uh, of, a, of a TV special or something, you could hear the spontaneous humor. Larry Gelbart, one of his writers, who I talked to, said, you know, uh, Bob was funnier in person than any of his monologues. He was a great guy to work for. He was a naturally funny uh, person. And, uh, you know, but he knew that he needed that material constantly and no one can come up with it uh, at that kind of pace. Um, how about one more? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a complicated question. He was... Um, I'm sorry. She wanted to know what he was like as a person. Uh, that's a big question. He was, uh, he was a guy who was difficult to get to know. He was very closed off. He, was not, he did not open himself up to people, even people who worked with him uh, for a long time and you know, did not feel they knew him very well. He could be cold. He was uh, a distant father. He was away a lot of the time. Uh, but, and, and uh, you know, he wasn't entirely faithful to his wife. But he kept that marriage together. And uh, he was a guy that people really enjoyed working for. He worked them hard. He was uh, uh, very, in a sense, selfish in the sense that he thought he could call at any time of the day or night and ask his writers for a joke for the morning. Uh, he, they were always on call. You were 24-7 working for Bob Hope. But he, he was such an uplifting, kind of positive um, life force, I think, that the writers, most of the writers, really enjoyed working for him, even if he gave Mel Shavelson an ulcer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes tonight's event. Please join us for a light supper. Scott Berg and Richard Zoglin will also be signing books in the rotunda.